So we had finished diffusion, uh, facilitated diffusion and filtration. And now we are going to do something called osmosis, which is the diffusion of water, just water. So in other words, you have other solutes which are not able to diffuse. So those are known as non-penetrable solutes. So when we are talking about osmosis, we are only talking about diffusion of water. So water is the only thing that can move across the membrane. Other solutes which are present cannot move. Okay? So osmosis is only the diffusion of water. And again, it will go from an area where water is in a higher concentration to an area where water is in a lower concentration. So let's see some terms that we use when we talk about osmosis. The first term that we use is we, we will see that we label solutions um, as isotonic or hypertonic or hypotonic. So we use the word tonic or tonicity, which is the ability of a solution to change the shape of a cell by altering the volume of water inside it. So it will either drag water into it or push water out of it. So that is tonicity. So solutions which have more sol solutes in it, that means they have less water. So they have more solutes but less water. Such solutions are known as hypertonic. Those solutions which have more water and less solutes are known as hypotonic. Less solutes. less solutes and more water is hypotonic. So since osmosis is a process where there is diffusion of water from an area of greater concentration to an area of lesser concentration, hypotonic solutions have more water, right? Hypertonic has less. So, so osmosis will occur from a hypotonic solution to a hypertonic solution. Osmosis will occur from hypotonic to hypertonic. So just to quickly give you an example, let's take this beaker of water and it has just water in it, okay? And this is 100% water. So the concentration of water is 100%. And let, let me say that the volume was 50 ml. So 50 ml of 50 ml is all water. So it's 100%. Okay. Let's take another beaker here where I have, let me say I have 50 ml of water and then I add 25 grams of sodium chloride in it. Okay. Salt which will break up into sodium and chlorine, so 25 grams. And say, let's say this volume becomes 75 percent, uh, 75 ml. So how much is water in this? 50 over 75? 25. Right? 50 over 75. Okay? So that's two-thirds, so about 66 percent. Two-thirds, if you divide two-thirds, it will be 66 percent, right? And how much is sodium chloride? 25 over 75. So that's one third, right? So that's about 33%. Followed? So if you compare these two solutions, here water is 100%. Here water is 66%. Which solution, and I say this was A and this is B. This solution would be hypotonic, right? And this solution would be hypertonic. Followed? Why? Because there is more water here. There is less water here and more solutes. Do you see that? So now if, if this was a semi-permeable membrane here, which did not allow sodium chloride to pass across, it only allowed water to go, what would happen? Water would go from here into this solution, right? From hypotonic to hyper. Because from an area of greater concentration <laughs> to an area of lesser concentration. Followed? In real life, the way you see it is, 
um, you know, you take these dried garbanzo beans or you take uh, red kidney beans, which are dried, which you get in the grocery store. And you, they ask you to soak it overnight or at least for some time. You know, try that when you go home. Take a bean or, a, you know, garbanzo peas or, or anything, anything which is dry and put it in a bowl of water. What happens that garbanzo bean has solutes in it. Water has been removed. It's been dehydrated and that's why it's, it's dry, right? But it has still got solutes in it. Usually you dehydrate it by putting in strong salt solution. So it's got solutes in it. And when you put it in a bowl of water, just plain water, tap water, that has more water and less solutes in it. So that is hypotonic and your bean is hypertonic. What happens? The bean draws water into it, isn't it? And it swells up. So can you see that that's by the process of osmosis, okay, from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration and it is the movement of water, followed? In your body, this happens, if, again, it is because of the, the tonicity is whether there are more solutes in it or there are less solutes. The more solutes there are in it, we call it hypertonic, okay, and what do hypertonic solutions do? They tend to draw water towards them. What do hypotonic solutions do? They tend not to draw water towards them. Instead, they tend to throw it out, right? So in your body, one example of where this affects, there's a imbalance in homeostasis is that in your bloodstream, so in a blood vessel, um, there's plasma, there's water, and there are solutes which are floating in the blood vessel. And these are the solutes that we learned about in chemistry. Remember, we did proteins. The proteins are very large molecules. So there are proteins present in your plasma called albumin, uh, globulin, fibrinogen, all of these. Antibodies are proteins. You've heard of some of these, right? Antibodies, albumin at least, you know. Uh, these are very, very large molecules. They cannot pass through. They stay in the blood. You have sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium. All these are solutes also, okay? So all of these solutes are floating along with the water there. There is also fluid which is flowing through, I mean, there's plasma. The blood is fluid, right? And these are cells and, and these all these electrolytes and uh, uh, solutes dissolved in it. So the fluid pressure, if you remember, I said was something called hydrostatic pressure or filtration pressure. Remember when we did filtration? I gave you that example when you sit for very long and your veins swell up. The fluid fills in them, so the pressure builds up, right? And what happens if the hydrostatic pressure is more, it tends to throw fluid out, right? So in a blood vessel, the hydrostatic pressure would tend to throw fluid out. Um, don't worry about writing this. I will send you guys a link with, with this so you can listen, look at that link. But right now, just see what I'm doing. So hydrostatic pressure tends to throw fluid out. And here are cells of your body. And here is the extracellular space, extracellular space. So hydrostatic fluid uh, pressure tends to throw fluid out, and that's the fluid which bathes all these cells. But if you keep throwing fluid out, what will happen? By the time the artery becomes a vein, you'll have very little fluid left inside it, right? But we don't want, it to, want that to happen. We want the same blood volume to be circulating. So at this end, what happens is the hydrostatic pressure is throwing fluid out. Osmotic pressure here inside the blood vessel is more than the osmotic pressure here. That means the solutes are more compared to the solutes here in the extracellular fluid. They tend to, if this is hypertonic as compared to this, it will tend to draw water in. At the arterial end, the pressure is more than the solute, the pressure of the solutes. So water goes out. By the time you come to the venous end, the fluid flow has become very, very slow. So now the solutes remain the same. So here osmotic pressure wins and fluid comes back because the osmot presence of solutes tends to draw water into it, right? So fluid comes back into the blood vessel and that's how your blood volume is kept constant. As I gave you the example, when you sit for a very long time, what happens? Your leg veins swell like this. So there's more fluid in them so that hydrostatic pressure is winning all the time. So that's why fluid remains outside and your feet swell. Now imagine this situation in your body, suppose you had some kind of kidney disease where the kidney filtration membrane was damaged. Remember we said the membrane was semi-permeable, didn't allow large molecules to pass through. If it did, that means it's damaged. So if say the kidney membrane, the filtration membrane was damaged, these solutes go out like these large albumin and all these molecules go out. So in such a blood vessel, 
which is that flowing, you'll see less solutes. So if there are less solutes, that means it's not able to draw fluid back in, right? It's not hypertonic. Have you seen it? The hypertonicity has come down. In fact, it's becoming hypotonic. So when it doesn't draw fluid back in, the fluid tends to remain on the outside, which is in the extracellular space. And hence, in people with kidney disease, you may have noticed these people with kidney disease tend to look a little puffy. They, you know, under the eyes, they have little bags there. Their feet are swollen. You know, you can actually press and push down, and that's known as edema. So here you have swelling, but this swelling is very different from that swelling of your feet. The cause is different. In both cases, you have swelling. When your feet get swollen because you're sitting for a long time, that was an increase in hydrostatic pressure. In kidney disease, it, you have that swelling because there is loss of solutes. So with the result, your blood now, instead of being hypertonic, is actually slowly becoming hypotonic. So it's not able to draw fluid back inside it, inside the blood vessel. It remains outside in the extracellular space and causes edema. Okay? So you must understand the difference between these two, between osmotic pressure and hydrostatic pressure. Followed? Now let's look at a few um, videos on all of these. So let's start with this. Lack of cells, recording in one, two, three. Diffusion is the net movement of molecules down a this process of small molecules, such as oxygen and carbon dioxide, to cross the plasma membrane. Most polar molecules, such as sugars and proteins, cannot freely cross this lipid membrane. Although water molecules are polar, they are small enough to pass through the membrane freely. This special case of diffusion that involves the movement of water molecules across a membrane is called osmosis. If a molecule, such as urea, is added to one side of a membrane, it will not be able to diffuse across the membrane because it is both large and polar. Because of its polar nature, it will interact with other polar molecules, such as the water. This interaction reduces the number of free water molecules on the right-hand side. With fewer free water molecules on the right-hand side, there is now a net movement of water molecules down their concentration gradient to the side with the urea molecules. Because more water molecules are moving into this area than are leaving, the water level on the right side will rise. If the osmotic concentrations of two solutions are equal, the solutions are isotonic. However, when the solutions have unequal osmotic concentrations, the solution with the higher concentration of solutes is hypertonic, and the solution with the lower concentration of solutes is hypotonic. Now we call it isotonic, you use the word isotonic, we call it isotonic in us when the concentration is the same as the solutes in our bloodstream. So therefore, you don't give distal when you have to inject someone with um, an intravenous drip, you don't give them distilled water because that's pure, that has no solutes in it. You actually give them uh, what is known as saline, so isotonic saline solution, okay? Because you want to make sure that it is of the same uh, concentration as that in our body. Let's look at facilitated diffusion. So this doesn't have uh, audio with it. So you can see from the outside of the cell, this large molecule has to go inside. So it's using a carrier protein. And this carrier protein helps now to bring it into the inside of the cell. So the more carrier proteins you have, the more of these molecules can be transported. Of course, they can get saturated to a point, which is why sometimes that you will find some substances are not able to pass through because the carrier proteins are saturated, right? It's like having, if you have, to have, if you have five cabs, you can ferry maybe 15 people. But if you have 30 people, only 15 can go, the other five are left behind because you have to wait till they, they are, the cabs are free, okay? 
And let's look at filtration, which was, if you remember, a pressure gradient. It was water pressure or hydrostatic pressure. Filtration is the first of three main processes in urine formation. Blood flowing from the glomerulus exerts pressure, and this glomerular blood pressure is high enough to push water and dissolved substances out of the glomerulus and into the Bowman's capsule. This fluid then the glomerulus is nothing but a capillary network. Okay, so this red thing that you're seeing are all blood vessels or capillary network. Would that be considered This In this infiltration? No, filtration is totally hydrostatic pressure, just fluid pressure. That becomes known as the glomerular filtrate. The wall of the glomerulus contains pores and is similar to a strainer. The diameter of the pores determines which substances flow through and which remain. The only blood constituents that do not move into Bowman's capsule are the larger molecules such as blood cells and most plasma proteins, which exit the efferent arteriole. To summarize filtration, glomerular blood pressure causes filtration through the glomerular capsular membrane to create the glomerular filtrate. So you can see here how it was the pressure inside the capillary, which was more than the pressure here, and that's why it threw it out. You saw also how she mentioned that large molecules like red blood cells, white or cells, and proteins don't go through. Now in the kidney, if this kidney membrane was damaged, you can see how albumin would be able to pass through, so you will find it in the urine. We always check the urine of pregnant women to see if there's any problem in the ki kidney filtration membrane. And when the... Uh, if albumin were to pass out, what will happen? Solutes are less, so now the blood, in effect, is becoming hypotonic, so it can't draw water back into it, so it will stay outside in the extracellular tissues and cause edema, okay? Now, think of this situation. If I was to put a red blood cell in a hypertonic solution, what would happen? Okay, well, 48, about half the class got it right. It will shrink. Remember, I'm telling you, I'm putting it in a hypertonic solution. That means that solution is hypertonic compared to the red blood cell. Hyperton where does, how does water move from hypotonic to hypertonic, right? So the red blood cell, in effect, is hypotonic. This is hypertonic. So it, the hypertonic solution will draw fluid from the red blood cell. So it will automatically shrink. If on the other hand, I put a red blood cell in a hypotonic solution, so that solution is hypotonic compared to the red blood cell. So what will happen? It will move from the solution into the red blood cell and it will swell and it will rupture. Okay? So we have done passive processes. So now we are going to do active processes where energy in the form of ATP is utilized. Large molecules can be transported this way. And also, you can go against the concentration gradient. So you can go against the concentration gradient. So instead of going from high to low, you can actually go from low to high. It's like going uphill. So isn't it more difficult to go uphill? You use more energy. When you go downhill, it's easy, right? So this is like going uphill, so from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. One good example of active transport is the use of the sodium-potassium pumps, which we'll do in more detail when we do muscle contraction. So if you remember, I told you that in muscle, con in the resting membrane potential, we kind of briefly touched on it where I said the outside of the cell membrane is more positively charged compared to the inside. So in the body, there are more, uh, let's look at the muscle cell, there are more sodium out ions on the outside of the cell membrane of a muscle cell. And 
more potassium ions on the inside the charge the positive charge on the outside is much more than the positive charge on the inside so that's why we say the outside is more positively charged compared to the inside now when a nerve impulse comes it kind of stimulates it and what it does is it changes the permeability so sodium ions a few sodium ions begin to go in and a few of the potassium ions go out okay now we want to bring this we can't leave it in this what is called depolarized state this change state so we want to get the sodium back outside and the potassium back inside to you know come back to normal but can you see that there are more sodium on the outside so sodium has to go against a concentration gradient right it has to go and potassium also when it comes in against going against a concentration gradient in order to do that you have these pumps called sodium potassium pumps which kind of pick up sodium use atp and push it out and on the way they bring potassium back in and i'll show you a video for that okay the second type of active transport is where which is called vesicular transport the word vesicle means like a small balloon the word vesicle means a small balloon or small fluid filled sac so vesicular transport is of two types exo and endocytosis exo meaning pushing something outside endocytosis is bringing something inside so always try to kind of relate these terms and instead of memorizing them exo is outside endo is inside so exo is pushing something outside so you're, what you're pushing is you're making up these small fluid filled sacs and you're going to push it outside and most of the secretions in our body go out through a by means of exocytosis so for example in the pancreas when a lot of enzymes are made and those have to reach the lumen of the small intestine they there are uh, organelles which make these little vesicles and they actually go outside they kind of pushed outside so this is exocytosis endocytosis is when something is taken inside and this is of three types endocytosis either you take a pretty large molecule inside this this could be cell debris it could be a bacteria a bacterium any cell debris which needs to be removed and here what will happen is that a cell which is known as a phagocyte so suppose this is a bacterium this phagocyte will go towards it and what it will do is it will throw out little feet like this this is the nucleus this thing i'm drawing here is the nucleus okay and this is the bacterium these little feet are known as pseudopodia these then come closer to each other and they finally fuse like this and this little bacterium is kind of now stuck inside this membrane will rupture so you the bacterium will be, remain in a membrane like this and here's the nucleus and then it will get digested by the digestive enzymes inside so can you see that the bacterium has been drawn into the cell okay so this is obviously done because you have got to throw out these feet it's obviously done by cells which have a lot of cytoplasm some cells capable of phagocytosis one example are macrophages these are actually monocytes which you'll see in blood monocytes get converted into macrophages another cell capable of phagocytosis which again you'll do in blood is a cell called a neutrophil and then when you do the nervous system you will see another cell which is known as a microglia there are many more cells there are kupfer cells and so on but the cells that you are going to be doing in the next few weeks are these monocytes neutrophils and microglia monocytes are the ones which get converted into macrophages what's the last one microglia microglia the next type of endocytosis 
is called bulk phase endocytosis where dissolved nutrients are taken inside the cell. And again, I'll show you a video of that. So it's not one solid particle, but these nutrients are dissolved and they need to reach the cell. So the cell kind of forms an indentation and it also drinks up these, these nutrients. It's often also known as pinocytosis or cell drinking. Pinocytosis or cell drinking. Endocytosis. The third example is what is called receptor-mediated endocytosis. So on the surface of the cell, so this is the cell, on the surface of the cell there are certain receptors which will react only to certain substances. This usually is seen when hormones have to be taken inside by a target cell. So the hormone will come and interact with the receptor, the specific hormone to the specific receptor. This will then form a little vesicle like this. And then these, this vesicle kind of goes inside and then the cell membrane, you know, joins that way. So again, I'll show you a video of this. And we have, I have pictures also of this, okay? So this is called receptor mediated, meaning there are specific receptors which will interact with a substance. So that's why the receptors mediate it. Not everything can go in by this manner, okay? So let's look at sodium potassium pumps. The sodium potassium pump is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate group from the ATP remains bound with the channel. The sodium ions are released on the other side of the membrane outside of the cell and the new shape of the channel has a high affinity for potassium ions and two of these ions now bind to the channel. This binding again causes a change in the shape of the protein channel and this conformational change releases the phosphate group on the cytoplasm side. This release allows the channel to revert to its original shape and as a result the potassium ions are released inside the cell. In its original shape, the channel has a high affinity for sodium ions, and when these ions bind again, they initiate another cycle. The important characteristic of this pump is that both sodium and potassium ions are moving from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. In other words, each ion is moving against its concentration gradient. This type of movement can only be achieved by the constant expenditure of ATP energy. So you see they're moving down, you know, like they're climbing uphill. They're moving from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So it takes more energy. So that's why they need energy. Let's look at vesicular transport. So it doesn't show all. You can see it's most of it. substances taken in by single-celled organisms molecules that cannot cross the hydrophobic plasma membrane. Many single-celled eukaryotes employ endocytosis to ingest such food particles. In this process, the plasma membrane extends outward and surrounds the food particle. Cells use three major types of endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is particulate, such as a bacterium or a fragment of organic matter, the process is called phagocytosis. If the material the cell takes in is liquid, it is called pinocytosis. Specific molecules, such as low-density lipoproteins, LDL, are often transported into eukaryotic cells through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Molecules to be transported first bind to specific receptors on the plasma membrane. The interior portion of the receptor protein is embedded in the membrane. The protein clathrin coats the inside of the membrane in the area of the pit. 
When an appropriate collection of molecules gathers in the coated pit, the pit deepens and seals off to form a coated vesicle which carries the molecules into the cell. Exocytosis is the reverse of endocytosis. This process results in the discharge of material from vesicles at the cell surface to the outside of the cell. Let's look at another one of receptor-mediated endocytosis. Specific molecules, such as low-density lipoproteins, LDL, are oh, often transported one. into eukaryotic cells through receptor... Okay, I didn't realize. It's the same one that we saw in the earlier one. So you can see how exocytosis and endocytosis are opposite. And you can see how in endocytosis you got a little vesicle being formed inside. And in exocytosis it was a vesicle which is then thrown to the outside, right? So that's why it's called vesicular transport. So here let's look at a picture of exocytosis. So on this side you can see how the vesicle is forming, attaches to the cell membrane, the substance is removed and the cell membrane forms there. And same thing here. So this is vesicles are usually formed in a cell organelle known as Golgi apparatus. So it forms this secretory vesicle which goes and fuses with the cell membrane and at this point it will open out throughout its substance and then that point of the cell membrane will close, okay? You, you don't need to kind of uh, bother too much about these membrane proteins and so on. And here with endocytosis, again you can see usually when you look at endocytosis, this is the normal way and three things can happen. So actually there are little protein coated parts to the cell membrane. So you can see how this has been ingested. It goes in, it forms a few things in will attach to a lysosome which will kind of digest it like you can see up here so it digests it or it kind of attaches to another substance called an endosome and this home then take you know may take it back outside and you know return it to the cell membrane so these are an example that we notice how digested anything it is usually attached to a lysosome, which we'll see later is what's called a Swiss. This is cytosis where the you know new evolved sample when you uh, in the digestive tract when your food is being digested by various enzymes and it's broken down into smaller and smaller particles. A lot of them, which are in a liquid state, are taken in by pinocytosis. And here is the receptor-mediated endocytosis where a good uh, example is hormones because they're very receptor-specific. Uh, other things are lipid example of some proteins or LDL proteins, okay? So these are receptor-mediated uh, endocytosis. Let's answer this question. Which of the following is example of Okay, the last D is the right answer. Gas exchange in the lungs is an example of simple diffusion. Remember, right in the beginning when we talked, I told you how carbon dioxide it is at a higher concentration in the blood capillaries. It goes into the alveolus or air sac. Oxygen is at a higher concentration in the alveolus, so it comes into the capillary. So it diffuses across. In fact, that's why they have a very thin wall, the alveolar sac. Okay, so that's simple diffusion. 
popcorn odor and I gave you an example in class the other day if I was to spray perfume in the beginning the concentration is high at the spot where I spray it and then it permeates throughout the whole room. Same thing with popcorn odor. It spreads around. So it's going from an area where you actually made the popcorn so high concentration and then when it goes up it's diffused across the whole room so that's low concentration. So again simple case of diffusion. Sugar cube dissolving in water or even salt dissolving in water when you put a cube in pardon when you put a cube in water so at that point there's high concentration as you keep stirring it it spreads around so it's going from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration till it's evenly spread out or equilibrium is reached okay neutrophil engulfing and a bacterium is an example of phagocytosis right we just saw that so this is active transport it uses ATP it's not diffusion okay so that's this was the correct answer Let's look at cell organelles now. So we look at the, begin with the nucleus. Very important center, it is the control center, important for cell division. And there's nuclear division is known as mitosis. So mitosis is nuclear division. So mitosis is a part of cell division and it is very important. If you didn't have a nucleus, you would not be able to divide. So red blood cells, for example, right? They're, they cannot divide, make more red blood cells. Like the cell membrane, the nucleus also has a membrane surrounding it, which is selectively permeable. So it has little pores in it. The nucleus contains genetic material, which is DNA. It has a small nucleolus in it, which is mainly RNA and proteins. Usually cells have one nucleus, usually. But we have situations in the body, liver cells for example, they may have more than one nucleus. Okay, and that's not abnormal. So they may be multinuclear. The, the muscle cell, skeletal muscle, has actually not just one nucleus, it has many nuclei, so it's multinucleate. Now when we look at uh, genetic material inside the nucleus, the DNA, the DNA in an inactive phase is made up of thin threads like this, which are actually called chromatin. It's actually called chromatin. And chromatin is better used when we look at chromosomes and each thread of the chromosome is called the chromatid. So I'll explain that. So chromatin is in an inactive form. So if you look at a cell which is not dividing, the DNA is kind of a little thread-like like this. And this is known as chromatin. When it begins to divide, what happens is that this chromatin condenses and becomes thick and coiled and then it forms, then you can actually see the chromosome. You can see it really well. So it becomes thick and coiled like this. It becomes really thick and coiled. And the reason it becomes thick and coiled and shorter is that during cell division, cells come close to each other, then they separate. So if they were thin and long, there's likelihood of them breaking off. And you don't want that to happen. You know, the shorter and the thicker they are, less chances of breakage. Now, when we do cell division, you'll see that before, before a cell begins to divide, actually this chromosome, it, the DNA inside, it duplicates. So this becomes two like this, which is what I've drawn here. So it's still one chromosome, but now it's made up of two threads. Have you noticed oh, the difference? Okay, so this is still one thread, this is two threads, it's still one chromosome. This, these threads of this chromosome is, are known as chromatids. The threads of the chromosome are known as chromatids. When we go into the cytoplasm, this is where all the activity takes place, all the cellular metabolism. And various organelles bring out a lot of this activity. So let's look at the first one. 
which is mitochondrion is singular, mitochondria is plural. And this is how it looks, this is what it looks like, a mitochondria. So it's got an outer shell and an inner shell, which is kind of where the membrane you can see is folded like this. And there, this is where enzymes are present on this. So these folds that you see like this, these are known as crista. Plural is cristae. So it contains a lot of mitochondrial enzymes which are able to break down glucose, fats and proteins and convert them into ATP. So that's why we often call mitochond sorry, we call mitochondria the powerhouse of the cell. So this is known as the powerhouse because it produces ATP. Yeah, mitochondria, uh, the cell, in order for a cell to reproduce, it needs the nucleus because cell division is mitotic division and cytoplasmic division. Okay, so but here, my, when I say mitochondria capable of reproduction is that the mitochondria can duplicate themselves. Okay. Yeah, so mitochondria can duplicate and form more mitochondria. Okay. So cells, cells which are very active, where they need a lot of energy, have a lot of mitochondria in it. One example is muscle tissue, right? Muscle needs a lot of oxygen, a lot of ATP for energy. So in fact, when you actually go to the gym and you work out and you do train resistance training and so on and you beef up your muscles, the muscle fibers or muscle cells don't increase in number but they increase in size. And they increase in size because of an in, in increase in the cytoplasm, because of an increase in the mitochondria, the number of mitochondria, because so that they can produce more ATP for that cell, increase in the connective tissue and blood vessels, okay? So anything where you need more energy, you will find more mitochondria in them, and muscle is a good example. Ribosomes are small little cell organelles which are capable of synthesizing proteins. So you'll find them in areas where, in cells which manufacture a lot of protein, any cell which has enzymes, which manufactures enzymes, hormones. This is where you'll find a lot of ribosomes. Now they may be free, they may just lie free as small little organelles, or they may be attached to another cell organelle which is known as endoplasmic reticulum, which is the next one which we'll see. So ribosomes may be free or attached, and when they're attached, they're attached to endoplasmic reticulum. And here, this shows you endoplasmic reticulum. And notice the two types of endoplasmic reticulum. When these ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, it looks rough. When you observe it under the electron microscope, it kind of looks very, very rough on the outside. So that's why it's known as rough endoplasmic reticulum. And if you look at the structure of endoplasmic reticulum, can you see it's like a highway. There are a series of little channels which are present here. Okay, so all interconnecting channels. And rough endoplasmic reticulum, because it has these ribosomes sitting on top of that, it helps to manufacture uh, proteins because the ribosomes are the ones doing that. And then that those proteins are transported through these channels. And then we'll see that they are then pushed to the next organelle, which is called the Golgi apparatus. So that's why we often call them endoplasmic reticulum, we call it transporters because they help to manufacture and transport proteins. They're also seen to manufacture membranes like the cell membrane because cell membrane also has protein in it and other membranes in the body. Because of proteins, these are seen in, because they manufacture and transport proteins, these are seen in cells which do have a lot of secretory activity. In a lot of glands, you will find them because hormones, for example, many hormones are protein in nature. Many are steroidal, but many are protein in nature. 
glands also produce enzymes so all the glands for example um, many of the glands in the digestive tract they are producing enzymes so again they like the pancreas is one example okay liver our uh, liver doesn't uh, produce bile is not an enzyme um pancreas a salivary gland produces enzymes so it's again part of the digestive tract so you can see that they will contain a lot of um rough endoplasmic reticulum because manufacture and transport of those proteins in comparison to rough endoplasmic reticulum we have areas where you have smooth endoplasmic reticulum again these are series of channels but they don't have any ribosomes sitting on top of them so it gives it a smooth appearance they don't have anything to do with protein metabolism on the other hand they have a lot to do with breakdown and synthesis lipid metabolism so breakdown of lipids or even synthesizing lipids even synthesizing steroid hormone steroids have lipid a partly lipid in nature so steroid hormone synthesis they also cause breakdown of glycogen which is a complex carbohydrate they break it down into glucose so glycogen is a complex carbohydrate often stored in the liver and skeletal muscle so it's a complex carb and when the body needs it it's broken down into glucose and also the smooth endoplasmic reticulum helps in drug detoxification and any carcinogen which enters the body it helps to detoxify it this again is done this drug detoxification and carcinogen detox is done in the liver so can do you understand that the liver is likely to have a very very rich all the cells in the liver will have many or uh, you'll see a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in them right so for example if you got a question like this uh, which cell uh, which um, which of these organs or which cells or which of these organs are likely to have a uh, more endopl rough endoplasmic reticulum so anything which comes with secreting usually if you think secreting you secrete enzymes or you secrete hormones which are protein in nature so protein means ribosome and rough endoplasmic reticulum right so that's how you got to kind of make the connection so if i gave you a choice of let's say of uh, the pa uh, pancreas secretes uh, hormones and digestive enzymes so what do you think it's likely to have smooth endoplasmic reticulum or rough endoplasmic reticulum so obviously it will be rough endoplasmic reticulum okay the next uh, organelle is the golgi apparatus or also known as golgi body and if you notice it's very close to the rough endoplasmic reticulum because what the rough endoplasmic reticulum does is it manufactures and transports the proteins and then sends them by little vesicles if you notice you can see these little vesicles which now go and attach to the golgi membrane and this golgi body again is a series of stacked ch uh, channels like this so what it does is it's it's of, often called the packer so it packages and modifies what has been sent to it by the rough endoplasmic reticulum so they go hand in hand so anything which produces which secretes enzymes and uh, hormones and proteins will have golgi as well as rough endoplasmic reticulum so like for example i gave you the ex example of the pancreas it will have a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum as well as golgi body because golgi is the is the one which is actually going to package it and then throw it out of the cell so you find both going together so that's i've given you example here pancreas so it modifies and packages material for secretion and it also forms another cell organelle which is known as a lysosome so these lysosomes have digestive enzymes so these lysosomes contain digestive or what are known as acid hydrolase enzymes so whenever phagocytosis takes place and something is taken inside the cell like a bacterium or cell debris usually a lysosome will come in there and digest that bacteria so phagocytes tend to have a lot of lysosomes the next cell organelle is what is known as a peroxisome these are called detoxifiers so again seen a lot in the liver kidney is another area where detoxification occurs 
So they contain these oxidase and catalase enzymes, tend to detoxify alcohol, formaldehyde, and usually whenever in the body when metabolism is going on, free radicals are formed. These peroxisomes take care of the free radicals. They don't let them be free. They take care of them. They actually convert them to hydrogen peroxide. So that's how they detoxify your body. You don't want these free radicals to build up. So let's look at this question about biosynthetic secretory cells such as neurons. What would you expect them to have? more than other cells. So they are secreting. Rough endoplasmic reticulum, yes. See, lysosomes will only be where you have something that has been taken into the cell and needs to be destroyed. Here, you don't need any destruction. You're secreting something. So it's not lysosomes. Peroxisomes, again, is a case where you need to detoxify something. So here, I'm telling you that the cell is secreting something. Some, this cell is useful. It's pushing something out. So neither peroxisomes nor lysosomes. It's rough endoplasmic reticulum. So in the Peroxisomes, the enzyme catalase is what breaks down the hydrogen peroxide. Yes, yes. Here let's look at some more cell uh, organelles, centrioles. These are very important for cell division. So they make up the mitotic, help to make up the mitotic spindle. They also form the bases of cilia and flagella. Remember we talked about them, cilia and flagella, so they form the bases of cilia and flagella. And then we have other cytoskeletal elements. Cytoskeletal elements means the skeleton of the cell. So they give shape to the cell or there's some other activity. Microtubules are these thin little things that you see. I don't know if the, here you can see these little rays which go in, are going around. These are thin sort of little tubes which give shape to the cell. So microtubules give shape to the cell. And microfilaments are cell organelles which we see a lot of in muscle cells. And they take part in the contraction of muscle. So when we do muscle, you will see these micro. Uh, we will mention these microfilaments and how they come close to each other or move apart and that's how muscle contraction is brought about or muscle relaxation. So here this picture is really good. So you can see all of the cell organelles. You can look at these microvilli which we talked of earlier and notice smooth and rough and endoplasmic um, and nucleus and nucleolus, Golgi apparatus, rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum. This. Let's now look at one part of cell division. So remember cell division is made up of nuclear division, nuclear division and cytoplasmic division. Nuclear division is known as mitosis. Cytoplasmic division is known as cytokinesis. So cytokinesis is cytoplasmic division, which is here. So this cytokinesis is cytoplasmic division. It really is not part of mitosis. So this is separate, okay, cytoplasmic division. So cytokinesis is not 
part of because cell division is mitosis and cytokinesis. So I have it put here just to show you that it actually begins when mitotic division uh, is halfway through. Okay, so the, just that that reason. So these are the phases of mitosis. There's a phase which is known as interphase, which is actually when the cell is at rest and it kind of carrying out its activity. And it's further divided into various parts and we are not going to go over those parts. But just before a cell decides to divide, in interphase, in one of those phases of interphase, there are some activities which go on. First of all is that the centrioles and the DNA replicate. The amount of DNA doubles. The chromosomes don't double, but the DNA doubles. So what I'm trying to say is, let's say you have a cell like this, which has two chromosomes. You want to form a cell, you want to form two daughter cells like this, right? Now, if division was to occur normally without you doing anything, what would happen? If you just divided the cell right through the middle, what would you get? You would get one cell like this and one cell like this, isn't it? So that is not exactly like the daughter cell, right? So you have to do something. How you can do it is, if this is the cell, just before that mitotic division starts, what if you, the DNA, you doubled it? So you actually duplicated or what is called replication of DNA. So you made each chromosome now consist of two threads instead of one thread. Can you see that? Okay, so you can make it consist of two threads and each thread is known as a chromatid. Then as you become, suppose I number these chromosomes one and two. So each daughter cell has to have chromosome one and two, right? It can't have only one or two. So then these cells will actually, the chromosome one will be here and chromosome two will lie down here. I mean, they'll come close to the equator like this. And then now if I take my line through, <coughs> Can you understand? I'm going to get two cells with the same number of chromosomes, right? One and two. Have you followed? How, why there is a need for DNA replication or what is called duplication. So let's see the phases that we have. So once this DNA has duplicated or replicated and centrioles have also replicated, the first phase is called prophase. It's the longest of the phases. So now you want this, the nucleus to divide. So what happens is now the chromosomes become really prominent. You can see them. They're short and coiled. The mitot There's something called the mitotic spindle which forms and the nucleolus and nuclear membrane disappear because if the nucleus has to divide, you need the membrane to disappear. Otherwise, it will constrict it. In the second phase called metaphase, the cells come in live. Like I show you, they lay on the equator of the cell. In the third phase, the way you can remember is anaphase. The cells look like an A. So now those chromosomes are separated. They're kind of moving away from each other. So the chromosomes split. Remember, they were joined at that, you know, the two chromatids were joined. So they split. One chromatid goes to either end. At this point, around late anaphase, that's where cytokinesis begins. The cytoplasmic cleavage begins. Cytoplasmic cleavage begins around anaphase. Telophases, now the chromosomes have moved to the opposite ends. They uncoil, they again become thread-like and form chromatin. The nuclear membrane forms, the spindle disappears, the nucleolus appears, and cytokinesis is also completed at that time and you get two identical daughter cells, okay? Now, this cell division cannot keep on going in our body. There are certain areas of the body where cells divide really rapidly. I gave you examples. Can you tell me where they divide rapidly? Hair follicles, yes, very good. Epithelium. Epithelium, it's still epithelium. Bone marrow. Epithelium, Epi it's epithelium. And bone marrow, these are three areas, right? But often, in many parts of the body, you cannot have go on having cells keep on replicating. So cells have to die at a certain time and then new ones form. So apoptosis is a term given which is programmed cell death. So to make sure 
that your body functions are normal and cells just do not go on dividing needlessly. Certain cells have to die when their you know job is done or their time is done. That programmed cell death is known as apoptosis. So here let's look at the phases of mitosis. So this is the phase of interphase where the chromatin has duplicated, the centriole has duplicated. And then now we begin mitosis. So the first of mitosis phases is prophase. So can you see each chromosome now consists of two strands or two chromatids. And the centrioles are, are beginning to form what is called the mitotic spindle because you need something to pull it. The nuclear membrane will begin to disappear. And then the next, you know, this is when it's kind of just the beginning. So all the, the nuclear membrane has disappeared. Now these chromosomes are going to come and start lying very close to the equator. So the next after prophase, you have metaphase, where you see they are lying close to the equator. The nuclear, the centrioles are at either end, and these are the rays which kind of will help to shorten and drag the chrome or split the chromosomes. So notice here the chromosomes are split. So each daughter chromosome, one goes to either end. So if I labeled this 1, 2, 3, 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4, so you can see 1, 2, 3, 4 at e either end. And then cytoplasm, you can see cytokinesis is beginning, it's not showing, it's not, wasn't shown in the diagram, that's why I had that little thing. So cytokinesis begins in anaphase. And then now the, the chromosomes go to either pole or either end of the cell and cytokinesis is completed. So now you have two daughter, daughter cells which are exactly like that of the parent cell. So the nuclear membrane reappears. So each one has one centriole. The nucleolus reappears and you get that. Okay. So let's, yes. The last step is cytokinesis. cytokinesis is not the last step, but it is, it begins with late metaphase, late anaphase. It completes the total cell division. You can have a situation where you may not have cytokinesis. Do you understand? So when you don't have cytokinesis, then this cell will actually have two nuclei in it. Let me take a look at it. I, I, I have to see that. Let, let me take a look at it and we'll check it out. Yes. So really what, what ends up forming, though, is a parent cell and a daughter cell because you still have the original cell. It just went through transformation. Yeah, we, we call it two daughter cells because this parent cell, what, I understand what you're trying to say, that it's the original cell which has divided into two. So now these two are much smaller than the original cell. So you, you don't know which one you're going to call parents, so we say it's got two daughter cells, okay? okay? So that's why we say they're two daughter cells. So when cytokinesis doesn't complete, you still have two? You have two nuclei over there in okay. that cell, yeah. But when it is complete, you have, have two separate cells. cells. You'll have two separate cells, yeah. So let's look at the phases of mitosis. Let's dive into this animal cell and see how mitosis works. We pass through the plasma membrane, revealing the nuclear envelope with its pores. There are two centrosomes to the right of the nucleus and a nucleolus within it. During prophase, the chromatin is condensing. Each chromosome consists of two chromatids. The nucleolus breaks down and the centrosomes move apart building the spindle and asters as they go. The disappearance of the nuclear membrane marks the beginning of prometaphase. During prometaphase, the spindle invades the nuclear region. The spindle fibers are forming and breaking down. capture spindle fibers, they stabilize them by giving them something to pull against. 
The captured chromosomes are pulled to the equatorial plane and the cell is in metaphase. As we move our camera, you can see the metaphase arrangement on the equatorial plane. The centromeres divide, allowing anaphase to begin. Two processes are going on. The spindle fibers shorten and the poles move apart. Both processes move the chromosomes toward their destinations. We back away to observe the events of telophase. The spindle breaks down and the chromosomes elongate as the chromatin uncoils. Nuclear envelopes form and then nucleoli. Contractile ring causes cytokinesis, leaving two daughter cells, each genetically identical to the parent cell. Okay, let's answer this question. In which of the following cells would you not see spindle formation? Okay, it's red blood cell, and the reason is you all know for sure that red blood cell doesn't have a nucleus, right? So there is no division going on there, no nuclear division, so no mitotic spindle. All of the other cells, epithelial cells, regenerate very rapidly. Liver cell and bone cells, they both have nuclei, okay? So you know for certain that red blood cell doesn't have a nucleus, so no mitosis is going to take place in that, so no spindle formation, okay? So that's how you're going to answer. Suppose you didn't know about the others, okay? So you will get something where you know you have some information. Okay, so 